If there's one thing about me, is that I'm gonna be chronically online. I'm gonna insert my nose in wherever. I'm gonna keep my finger on the pulse. I'm gonna keep my nose up the ass, right? I have not felt this alive and well since Bye Sister. I know a bunch of people are saying like, oh my God, the world is healing. Beauty gurus stopped fighting with each other. And when COVID was happening and the dolphins were showing up in the Hudson River. There's one thing that I'm really, really gonna pay attention to. It's when men do women wrong and when women call them out. Whether it's Central C or whether it's Clinton Kane. If you are a liar, if you are a Peter, and if you are abusive, I have no problem calling you out. I will admit, I'm not the biggest watcher of the Cancel podcast. However, I think we all kind of know who Brooke Schofield is at this point. Brooke Schofield is a 27-year-old influencer who is the co-host of the Cancel podcast with Tana Mojo. Tana Mojo and her used to literally be foes. Like, they had a whole fight over a guy, and there was this, like, controversy going back and forth between them, and now they're best friends, and it's actually pretty cute. So this definitely shot Brooke Schofield up into fame so much. She's talented. She's funny. You also may have heard of her earlier this year when she was calling out Matt Reif. There's, unfortunately, nothing that you could pay me to print out a picture of that man. Essentially, Brooke talked about on her podcast how she was briefly dating Matt Reif. Matt Reif also seemed to be dating like five other girls while he was dating her and saying all the same things to them as he was saying to her. But what really, really was the kicker was that Matt Reif went on to say like really awful and terrible things about Brooke Schofield's body was very disgusting and like just a gross boy. And so she kind of went viral for doing that. Once again, I have known about this Clinton Kane controversy for a while now because she has talked about it, but this is definitely the most content that we have ever gotten out of it because, well, Brooke did a 14 part series about Clinton Kane. Why? Clinton Kane decided to promote his new song by posting a TikTok a few weeks ago saying, when you've been over the relationship for over two years, but she can't stop yapping. And who is the girlfriend in question that he was talking about? None other than Brooke Schofield. You cannot sit here and be like, I want the drama to end. I take accountability for my actions. If you're still gonna sit here and be like, I don't know why my ex is still upset over the thing that I did. Even though the thing that you did is like a running long list of like terrible, abusive, toxic things that you have done. Anyway, Anyway, let's get into it. Brooke, I wanted to call her Brooklyn for a second. Her full legal name, Brooklyn Schofield. I, I don't think her name's Brooklyn. Brooke Schofield on June 26th decides to make a whole 14 part series on TikTok where she called it, who the fuck did I marry? As a reference to Risa Tisa, who a few months ago did a huge, I think that was like 50 parts of her relationship where she actually did marry a man and the marriage turned out absolutely like this man was nuts. Brooke immediately jokes about wanting to be less psycho and then post this 14 part series, which I absolutely love and respect her for because that is incredibly funny. 14 parts is not as crazy as what we're about to get into. If you want some context, I'm recording this on Saturday, July 13th. If you know, then you know. And if you don't, then you'll find out later. I like to think of myself as a good smelling person, not because I just think that, but because I'm told that not to brag or anything, but it's true. That's like one of the best compliments to receive is that like, oh my God, you smell so good. What are you wearing? That's why I'm so happy that Semper is sponsoring today's video. Here is what the Semper packaging looks like. Really easy to lock it and unlock it. I just went on a trip recently and this was so easy to travel with. One of my favorite scents for the summer by Semper is Kenzie Loving Life. It has notes of citrus, juicy berries, jasmine, rose, musk. It smells very feminine, but very, very clean and not overly sweet. So this is like perfect for the summer. And then one of my favorite year round scents is Commodity gold. Featured notes are vanilla, amber, and sandalwood. You have to pry amber notes out of my cold, dead hands. Ugh. It's definitely a warm scent, but it is sweet. I feel like I could wear this every single day, but it really shines, especially in the fall. And like I said before, this makes it so easy for travel. I did not want to have to worry about being like on a six hour flight and perfume spilling all in my toiletry bag and being able to have the safe scent bird packaging like gave me so much peace of mind. Also, it's like so easy to just pop into my bag. Takes up no room. It's cute that it matches. And you truly do get so much product in the vials that you are sent. Obviously mine is not full because I use it. Future Nicole here. I just got my new Semper package in the mail. I have never been so excited for scents before. I got you or someone like you. This is by Atat Libre de Orange. A scent without notes, a perfume without borders. You or someone like you is an intentionally mysterious and evocative fragrance that transcends mere description, offering only hints of rose, mint, and herbs. And that's what it smells like. I never knew I needed a perfume that smells like mint, but I clearly do. And then I also got Dead Cool Extra Milk. A friend of mine wears this every single day and it smells amazing on her. A universal musk amplified. Keep your friends close and your scent closer. Smells like you, feels like pure comfort with amber bergamot and white musk. I am in fact layering these two. I need to leave the house today. Someone needs to smell me. 
immediately. Scentbird is such a great solution for purchasing fragrances. A lot of times there's so many like niche perfumes and certain scents that you're only available to find in stores and maybe you don't have easy access to even be able to go to those stores to even know what it smells like. Scentbird literally has such a diverse selection that you're bound to find something that you like and it saves you so much of that risk of buying a whole bottle of a perfume that you don't even really know if you like or not. Also, Scentbird is affordable. You get to try your first fragrance from Scentbird for only $8 and then your next month will be $16.95. And you know, if you are a fragrance fan, that that is cheaper than a lot of rollerball or travel size perfumes that you can buy in store. If you're interested in trying Scentbird, make sure that you use code 55Nicole or the QR code that's on screen or the link that's down below for 55% off your order at Scentbird. That is code 55Nicole for 55% off Scentbird. That's literally getting the product for half the price. Like that is such a steal. Thank you Semper for sponsoring today's video. Brooke admits that she ended up in a relationship with Clinton Kane because she was a fan of his music. Clinton Kane is an Australian artist. Putting this out at the CVS was honestly like a very humbling experience because the CVS employee was like, oh, Nicole Raffi, yeah, I saw the stuff that you printed. And it's like, okay, I'm not doing an anti-Australia campaign. It doesn't look like what it looks like. I can explain, but I won't. She said that she was a very big fan of his song, Chicken Tendies, which we now know is about his mom. Keep that in mind. Keep that in the back of your head, okay? She said that her and Tana used to listen to him all the time in her house, like blasting his music all the time. And then one day she gets a DM from Clinton Kane where he asks her on a date. She admits that she doesn't know if she wants to go to dinner. She doesn't know if she's attracted to him or not. However, he is residing in Las Vegas and he offers to fly her out to Vegas where she lives in LA. She declines because he is a stranger, but he persists. A while later, he then invites her to his show in Los Angeles. This all takes place in the first half of 2022. Brooke said that she purposely wore an unattractive outfit so that he would not be attracted to her because that is not what she wanted out of this. However, seeing him perform, seeing him be a very, very good performer, she was like, I think I might be attracted to this man. I get it, I get it, I understand. I get it. He then invites her to go to the same show in Los Angeles the next day, which she goes to. She says that she goes on the bus with him afterwards with a friend and then goes to a club and they make out. <laughs> then they go to a diner and talk for like four hours, okay? Keep that in mind. Like the four hours is extremely fucking important. And he decides to open up to Brooke about his life and what happened the year prior in 2021. So not only did his mom die, but his dad died and his brother died. He opens up to her and tells her that he was homeless and had to sleep in parks and backpack in Europe and plays music. And that's how he eventually got discovered was like on the streets of Europe. Brooke was very impressed by all of this. She was like, oh my God, I can't believe that you're doing all of this after like losing three of your family members. Like that is actually nuts, like props to you. And she was very, very, very like enamored by him because of this. She was also really attracted to him because he said that he grew up in Perth and studied medicine, something that she also did before she was doing social media. So then the next day he calls her and says that he was going to a music video shoot, but then he tested positive for COVID since they were making out the day before. She probably definitely has COVID as well. And he suggests that maybe they should quarantine in the one hotel together because there's nothing else for them to do. Like they might as well quarantine if they both have COVID. And the one hotel is a very, very, very nice hotel, okay? And so Brooke, because of this conversation the night before, this four hour rendezvous that they had, she was like, oh my God, yeah. Like, yeah, I, I want to quarantine with you in a hotel. So she said that in this time she had no knowledge of his social media or kind of like what he did on social media as much like she wasn't able to go and investigate because she was with him in person the entire time while they were quarantining she said that he's playing music for her that he's like serenading her every night and then afterwards they were like oh, we can't stay in this hotel all the time so like let's go to an airbnb i want to go stay at an airbnb on the beach and she's like oh my god duh like this sounds like a dream come true like that's like a perfect fucking meet cute that's how a lot of people actually ended up together during covid was quite literally getting COVID and then having to quarantine together. Now, Brooke mentions that at the time when they were at this Airbnb, he wasn't really willing to let her go home so easily. Like she wanted to go home and get a change of clothes and shower and do whatever she needed to do. And he was just making a big fuss if she wanted to go like, why don't you want to be with me? Why don't you want to be near me? I can come with you. It was just a lot, a lot at once. And Brooke sees this as a good thing because she's like, oh my God, like he really likes me. Like he's obsessed with me. And when you're looking at all of these things, like with rose colored glasses on, like all the red flags just look like flags, you know? So Zach Sang, who is a very, very popular interviewer journalist has his own show on YouTube called The Zack Sang Show. You may know him. I've mentioned him before in the Ariana Grande interview. He has interviewed pretty much anyone and everyone. Like you can look him up and find interviews with like any celebrity ever. And I'll be honest, I was a really, really big fan. Like I have watched a lot of my favorite celebrities on there. Like I watched Conan Gray. I've seen 
I like can't think of any more people. I'm like, Conan Gray, Conan Gray, Sabrina Carpenter, Billie Eilish, like everyone. So Zach saying Clinton and Brooke were all hanging out and Zach saying says to Brooke, Brooke, if you do not date this man, you are so stupid. You have to date this man. He is gonna blow up. He's gonna be so successful. Like his career is literally skyrocketing right now. You'd be stupid to not fucking date him right now. So of course, having like the influence of your friends, you're like, oh my God, duh. Like, yes, clearly if they see a good thing in front of me, then sure, I'll jump on that too. So now they're in a committed relationship with each other. She quotes this to be like May slash June of 2022. And he books a weekend getaway to Joshua Tree together. In this time, he is driving his car, okay? And he gets pulled over by a cop on the way to Joshua Tree in his Tesla Model X. And Brooke says that he gives his Australian ID to the police officer. And the police officer is then reading off his information and was like, okay, it says you were born in 1999. Brooke was confused because she was like, 1999? Brooke at the time thought that he was only one year younger than her. Turns out he is actually four years younger than her. She also finds out that the car is not registered in his name. It's not his car. So when Brooke brings this up to him, he's like, oh my God, it's just a fake ID. Like I, I somehow got away with it. Like we're really, really lucky. Like I shouldn't have handed that to him. It was a fake. Why would you have a fake ID to appear younger? But you know what? I was following this one musician on social media and we were friendly with each other and we would sometimes reply to each other's stories. And one time he posts a picture of all of his driver's licenses like and it, to show how different he looks every single year. And he had a different birth year on every single ID. Every single ID was a little bit different. 1999, 1997, 1995, 1994. And I was like, which one's the real one? Like I was genuinely really nosy and curious. I was like, which, which one? is the real one and he tells me it's the one like that makes him appear the oldest is the real one why do you have all those other fakes that make you look younger that makes no fucking sense anyway i don't talk to that person anymore brooke brushes this off once again do you look at everything with rose colored glasses on all the red flags start to just look like flags so they finally had their first fight and this just came out of thin air i don't say finally and like a, oh finally i say finally and like a, it was bound to happen finally so brooke is looking at her phone while they are eating dinner and he says that it's a major trigger of his to not pay 100 attention to him because that's what his mom did and that was super traumatic for him and it's now very unresolved since she died like he can never resolve that trauma with her about her not paying attention to him because because his mom's dead, like, duh. And Brooke said that she never saw a man throw a tantrum in that way before. She said it was so rational, it was like talking to a child, you just had to apologize to him and there was nothing that you could do to like console him except just like repeatedly apologize. I'll probably be bringing this up throughout the video, but one of the reasons why I empathize with Brooke so much and I believe her story and I believe why it's true is because I have dated someone who is so fucking similar to a lot of the things that Clinton Kane has said and done. It's actually, fucking wild. So what she said, throwing a tantrum like a child over, you know, something like that, like not paying attention to you during dinner, even though they had been together the entire weekend. I was like, I see myself in you, girl. I really do. She also claimed that worsening his trauma was the basis of a lot of their fights and that she reminds him so much of his mother and how she should be more sensitive to that. And there were times where he would go on rampages and he would blow up her phone while she was out with friends, say that he was going to drink like half a bottle of vodka and how she needs to get to him immediately or he would do like crazy things like go driving. So the relationship began to be pretty tumultuous at this point. He was also rolling out his first album since all of the trauma had happened the previous year of all of his family dying. So as part of his press tour, he goes on the Zack Sang show, which he talks about, you know, his dead mother, losing his brother, losing his dad, his accent, he even does a few like American accents on there. Keep going, sorry. Sorry to interrupt you, mate. Love ya. <laughs> that was the strongest your accent's been since you've been in here. Yeah. It sounded pretty American until you just said sorry. Really? Mate. Yeah. Ah, oh, damn it. And it's important to know that Zach is one of Clinton Kane's best friends at this time. And Zach gives a lot of really good questions and like gives a lot of insight into Clinton's life. Like Clinton admits that he had to do the funerals through Zoom because of how bad COVID was. And you know, they were in Australia and he was in America and how difficult that was. Did you go to Australia? No, I haven't. No, we did the funeral through Zoom. 10 minutes into it, I just fucking closed my laptop, but I couldn't do it anymore. <laughs> It was like too much. It's, and, it's, and that happened three times. So the interview then comes out on YouTube in July, 2022. Brooke, for the first time, posts a TikTok with him in it. Keep in mind, he has not been posting her on social media, but she was posting him. She posts him on TikTok and a bunch of girls start commenting like, uh-oh, Brooke, 
Not him. Oh my God, not him. There are girls now in her TikTok comments saying that he cheated on his ex-girlfriend with 15 other girls. Meanwhile, Clinton was telling Brooke this entire time that his ex-girlfriend cheated on him with 15 other people. So Brooke confronts him and asks, did you cheat on your ex-girlfriend? In which he casually says, yeah, he was cheating on her the whole time of their relationship. And one of the girls that he happened to be cheating on his ex with, who we'll learn a little bit more about later, but her name is Mia. One of the girls that he cheated on Mia with was Brooke because he was messaging Brooke nonstop for a year, sliding up into her DMs, offering to fly her out to Vegas when she was not into that because she was like, this is a stranger. I don't know this man. However, he claims that he was removed so long before the relationship even ended. And that's why he ended up cheating. Like one of his songs, I guess I'm in love is literally about this ex-girlfriend and people use this for their wedding songs. Like this is a very, very popular song of his yet he cheated on her. <laughs> Says how difficult it was because he was in Las Vegas and his ex-girlfriend was in New York City. The long distance was really difficult. Brooke somehow finds it in herself to forgive this man. They have a sleepover that night. The next morning, he is on the phone with his manager begging for his manager to do anything to get the Zach Sang interview deleted off of YouTube. Brooke is kind of confused because she just has not seen the interview yet. So while he's on the phone with his manager being like, just do what you need to do to remove this video, she's going and reading the comments. Someone had left a comment saying, this is strange. I don't know where his accent came from. I know him. He's from Brunei. Brunei is a tiny nation on the island of Borneo in two distinct sections surrounded by Malaysia and the South China Sea. It's not Australia. This same person in that YouTube comment also claims to have seen his mom. Yet in the Zach Sang interview, he was saying his mom had been dead since the year prior and how these songs were about his mom, about how he lost her due to religion and how his relationship was so strained with her, and how it was very difficult and a very tumultuous relationship. And now she was dead and how that was very difficult for him to cope with. However, someone is now saying like, you're not from Australia, you're from Brunei and I, j I just saw your mom. So Brooke decides to stage this whole fight to get out of there and leave. Then she decides to go and look up his mother online because he had mentioned her name before, which was probably a really bad thing to do if you're planning on lying about, you know, your parents' death is to like give your actual parents' name. He decides to look up his mother. She has two Facebook accounts and on both accounts, she has not posted since before the day that she was apparently, you know, supposed to die. He claimed that his mom was Norwegian and blonde and Brooke is looking at his mother and she's like, this is not a Norwegian blonde haired woman. He also told Brooke that he grew up very wealthy in Perth and how he had nannies and maids and how his mom would leave for months at a time because she had businesses, even though she was a pastor. And she said that his life on Facebook looked nothing of the sort, that it seemed like their entire family was very, very close with each other. They did not seem to grow up where they would have nannies or maids. There was even a story of how she took him to Universal Studios and he was like, wow, I've never been to Universal Studios, but yet she was on his mom's Facebook page and there were photos of them at Universal Studios. This this house is in Brunei. This house is not in Australia. And his mom is Asian. His mom is not a white blonde woman. So she starts to pick up that her boyfriend's a liar. Her boyfriend of three months is a liar. Brooke said that it was very, very hard for her to come to terms with this. And she really, really, really struggled with all of this. She's also very open about her having BPD. I see the comments that Brooke gets like, why would you stay with him? Why would you be with him? Like, why would you not leave him after the first lie or the first red flag? Like until you are in a relationship with somebody who is so good at lying and so manipulative and so charming about it. And so easily gaslights you, you don't even realize how shitty of a situation that you are in. And especially when you are struggling with your mental illness, which Brooke said at the time she was not medicated for, it can be so extremely difficult that you cannot judge someone for why they did not leave at this moment. Why did they not leave at that moment? Why did they not pick up on what you pick, would have picked up on? Like you cannot say anything until you are in that situation at that very moment. Because we all like to think that we're like so much stronger what we really are in the situation when it happens to us because nine times out of 10, you won't even realize that it's happening to you. So she gives Clinton the opportunity to tell the truth and he proceeds to just lie for five minutes. And the only thing he decides to tell the truth about is that he is actually 22 and he is not 24. Brooke at this point doesn't even know if his mom is dead or alive at this point. Yeah, I know. Any words? So she goes to confront him and he doesn't admit to anything and he makes her feel so bad and says like, why would he lie about that? And she feels 
really terrible for it. It's like, fuck, I am a shitty person. I literally just questioned my boyfriend about his dead mother and if she's actually dead. And of course she's dead. Of course she is. I'm a terrible person. Brooke decides to stay in the relationship with him, but it loses a lot of trust and they are always fighting. This is a similar situation that I was in, okay? Brooke brings up a time that he started crying and throwing a tantrum because she said that Kid Rock is hot. Uh-huh. Shortly after, Brooke finds out that he's cheating on her with a lot of other people. A lot. Sending dick pics to other people. Like, damn. And he breaks up with her because she accuses him of cheating. So Brooke decides to be like, why the fuck are you lying about your mom's death then? Let's talk about that again. Let's talk about your mother. Why are you faking the death of your family? And Brooke says, I know that you're lying about your mother being dead because I've been talking to your mother. Which she admits she was not actually talking to his mother. But it got him to confess to her. Brooke in this whole saga has some very, very funny one-liners. Like she said that, you know, all he talks about is like, I wish I could just talk. I can't even do an Australian accent. I wish I could just talk to my mother just one last time. I, fuck, sorry. Every single video, it's my goal to just insult somebody with a different accent. It's usually the British. Now it's the Australians. I'm sorry. I wish I could just talk to her one last time, mate. And she's like, go fucking call her. And Brooke also brings up that the accent was not always on around her, especially when they were fighting. She would sometimes record the conversations while they were fighting so that she could look back on it and realize just how abusive it was, which fucking wish I did sometimes. And that he would turn it on when he was around other people and like her friends and things. Brooke also says, do him a service, stream his music. He needs money for therapy. But again, the accent would turn off sometimes when they fight. And then one of the funniest things that he says, he says demoralize in like the wrong context. And Brooke says, you don't even know what demoralize means. You didn't even use that right. So after Brooke put out all the videos last month, Clinton decides to put out a statement to Rolling Stone from his rep. The statement reads, Clinton, Kane, and Brooke Schofield had a brief three month relationship over two years ago, reads a statement sent to Rolling Stone. Brooke's recent comments regarding Clinton are untrue. In Thursday's statement, the rep says that the mother, in quotation, he referred to in interviews with Sang, was actually a very special mother-like figure in his teenage years who sadly passed. Not his biological mother, as was assumed. 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 The statement from the rep did not address any other details of the Schofield described. Clinton regrets the way that this devastating news was communicated at the time. Reads the statement, Clinton genuinely felt that he had lost an irreplaceable mother figure. Clinton was and is largely estranged from his immediate family. All right, you, you could be like, maybe he was talking about, you know, this mother figure. Absolutely. I know plenty of people who do not call their actual biological mother their mother, but yet somebody else who is more of a mother figure to them. And the Zach saying interviews. Clinton Kane literally talks about how he lost his mother to religion, how she was a pastor, how they had this terrible relationship with one another, how it was very tumultuous. All a part of Christianity in yes. the church. Yes, yes, yes. Because your mom's a Pentecostal pastor. Mm -hmm. Was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you're going to laugh about it? No, 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 no. I just love the is what i'm sorry <laughs> I, 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 it is. everyone my mom's dead yet now he is saying that this mother figure that he had lost was such a beautiful relationship how this mother figure he had not known for long but was very very formative in his teenage years a very special mother-like figure who sadly passed it just doesn't make sense it doesn't make sense it's like he combined the two stories into one yeah the relationship with my biological mother is very tumultuous and this mother-like figure had died so i'm gonna combine the two of these stories and say that my biological mother died and never ever ever mention anything about this mother-like figure he killed off his own mom from his from his lore the public rehashing of these details is only an attempt to bring attention and focus on brooke's podcast at the expense of tearing down another former boyfriend a tactic she's become known for read the statement from kane's rep referring to matt rife mm -hmm. in the years since this relationship took place clinton has moved forward and remains focused and committed to putting out new music brooke said that she's not doing this to bring in views for the podcast the the canceled podcast had already known about this whole situation like i said i knew about the whole clinton kane situation for a while now the only reason that she brought this all up and did the 14 part series on her tiktok was because clinton was trying to promote his new music by saying that brooke was yapping and couldn't stop yapping. She also points out that Cancel gets more listens in one week than he does in a whole year. Brooke was also reached out to in 2023 by Rolling Stone several times who were doing a story about Clinton Kane and the lies about him, or I should say the lies that he told about himself. And she decided that she wanted no involvement because she feared for his mental health and couldn't do it in good conscience even anonymously. However, now in 2024, after Clinton put out the statement to Rolling Stone, Brooke's statement back to Rolling Stone was ha 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 ha. Very, very funny. Very good. You know my cat, what well, my cat does every time I sneeze? Let me. 
Yeah. Before Brooke came Clinton's ex-girlfriend Mia, in which he had his most recent music video directed and edited by her. She is the one that he had cheated on with with 15 other girls. Mia claims that he killed his mom off while they were actively dating and said that during the relationship he called her and said, me mom died and she stayed with him for months while he actively grieved like made her fly you know across the country and go stay with him while he was grieving this entire thing Mia had found out that clinton's mom is actually still alive when brooke had told her that clinton's mom is still alive because he had never admitted that to her so march 2024 becca michi a tiktoker had made a tiktok about them going on dates together clinton kane used to be part of my roster. We used to go on some dates in New York, some dates in LA. This is before Brooke's 14 part series. And also alleges that Clinton's mother, father, brother, and in the video says sister had passed away. Becca says that there was so much love bombing and saying I love you all the time from Clinton. And as soon as Becca claimed that they were busy and had to go home and work after a four day date and had meetings, he would then blow up their phone. So one day when Becca is in a Zoom call because they were working. Clinton is blowing up Becca's phone saying that my brother just died and how they had canceled their whole work day in order to go and comfort Clinton as to which then they realized that Clinton had said four days ago that his brother had died. So what's the truth? Did your brother die four days ago or did your brother die today? In which then he says four days ago I accepted my brother was terminal but now he actually died. Becca having people in their life who had passed away, close family members, was like, I'm not gonna argue with someone with a dead brother. Like, I'm just gonna comfort them and like everyone has their own way of grieving and everything, so they comforted him. When adding up Becca and Brooke's timeline, they had both realized that Clinton was talking to both of them at the same time. This scenario reminds me so much of the scenario that I had in high school. <laughs> this is with another guy. This is another fucking random guy. This guy had feelings for me. I had no feelings for him. Sorry. And I remember I, you know, was very honest with this person. I was like, I, I don't have feelings for you like that. I, I see us just as friends. So one day they decide to text me this message, this ominous message, specifically being like, hey, bro, like everything's going to be okay. Like just enjoy the days that you have left with me. Like, like, yeah, I know I'm going to die soon. And like, I'm terminal, but like, let's just enjoy my last days together. And I immediately clocked it. I was like, what the fuck are you doing? That is not how you text your brother. If, if you were actually, actually, actually terminal and your family knew about it, you would not be saying, hey, brother, you would text your brother saying, hey, brother. And would you specify in that text being like, I know I'm terminal. Like if you're family members know about the situation, there's a different way that you guys speak about it. They immediately text me then after. I think they were waiting for me to respond and be like, oh, why you're you're dying? Oh my God. And instead I was like, what is this? And they were like, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. That, that was for my brother. That text was for my brother. Please like, just don't read it. Like, just please, I'm so sorry. Like, just ignore it, just ignore it. And I was like, okay, I will ignore it. Like I will. And he kept talking about it. He's like, I just, I just, nobody knows like i'm terminal i knew this guy had a lying problem and so i was like really like with one he's like i just i just like don't want to talk about it like yeah i asked his friends i was like is is your friend dying and he's like this is the first time i'm ever fucking hearing about this this is the first time ever miraculously a month later he like tells his best friend he's like guess what i'm not terminal anymore what a tactic what a flirting tactic you you don't like me? Well, I'm gonna die now. <laughs> and I will hold that over that kid's head until the day that we actually do die. Because who does that? Who does that? That was just a little side point. Becca had said that after Brooke and Clinton had ended, Clinton then went to Becca and said that Brooke was batshit crazy and how she was trying to convince people that Clinton was an awful person. Mind you, they actually ended because Brooke accused him of cheating and he actually was cheating. <laughs> so taking it back in time, Brooke Schofield, when Brooke was 24, she said on a podcast episode with Brianna Chicken Fry that she actively the other day just found out that her boyfriend was actually younger than he said that he was uh, well, how old yeah. are you 23 <laughs> okay how old are you uh, tw i just turned 23 okay how old are you i'm 25 okay but you know i just found out yesterday that my my boyfriend who i have been he just told me like very casually like oh i'm actually two years younger than i said 
Whoa. <laughs> like, what? How what? Did he, say he was? He said that he was 24, but he's actually 22, and that how he showed a fake ID to this police officer. Said he was born 1997, but he was actually born 1999. And in the video, coincidentally, Brooke apologizes for having an accent problem, which is like just funny retrospectively. In a lot of Brooke's old YouTube videos, she also does make a joke where she's like, you're lying about your accent, like you're putting it on. When in reality, it is believed that Clinton kind of came up with this Australian accent. On the Pretty Basic podcast, Brooke even said, that she thought that the accent was real even a bit after they broke up but just wasn't sure about it and how she has a friend who has family from Perth, Australia and they were on the phone with Clinton one day asking about where he's from and he could not tell them where he was from in Perth. And at this time, Brooke's friend was like, Clinton is not from Perth. That is not the accent of someone from Perth. And lied about having this car, which was this Tesla, which he said was his car because it actually was not registered in his name. It was registered in his friend's name. Lied about having two apartments that were not his. After this relationship had ended, Brooke said that she felt like her boyfriend had died. Because basically when somebody makes up a whole facade about themselves and then they end up not being the person that they said they were, yeah, it's, it's gonna feel like someone died. Like you're gonna mourn them. Like the person that was, but like was a figment of your imagination because they, they weren't real. So let's get into a little bit about Zach saying. <laughs> Zach has recently been in some hot water recently because of Trixie Mattel calling him out, saying that he referred to the theaters that she sold out as the bar is your lip syncing and, and doing these gigs. Basically not really respecting what Trixie does, not really doing his research beforehand. I was like interviewed by a guy. He was like, you know, your gigs when you're out there lip syncing in bars. And I said, yeah, the theaters I sell out have bars. Like, I was like, you really don't know anything yeah, like about talking about. Yeah, yeah, you know what the f you're talking about, bitch. Collection of what you do now, right? Like, just to wait tables, for instance, takes so much personality, so much charisma, so much, like, one-on-one -on -one energy, which, by the way, like, that's exactly what you're doing to a certain degree when you're up there performing to a bar full of people, and makeup is very much in the DNA of what you do as well. And yeah. You, you, you yeah, the theaters I work in do have bars. Also, a lot of people really hated the Tara Yummy interview. I watched the Tara Yummy interview. I could only get through like halfway because it was really, really hard to watch. I literally, his co-host said, so what's yummy about you? What about you is yummy? That was rude. Just a very, very weird way to interview someone. The questions that they were asking were like very personal and all kind of geared towards Tara's ex rather than her herself. And a lot of people do feel pretty uncomfortable about his age gap relationship. That's about 10 years. So on the most recent episode of the canceled podcast, Tana said that people in LA know that Zach Sang is a bit of a clout chaser. Zach Sang was one of Clinton's very good friends and how he encouraged Brooke very much so to date Clinton. So last year, Zach ended up having Tana on his show, the Zach Sang show, and wanted to talk about Clinton Kane on there. Now, Clinton going on Zach Sang dug his own hole. He really, really lied on there about the situation with his mom dying. And Brooke had begged Zach not to release this episode about Clinton Kane. And Tana had let Brooke know like, hey, Zach asked a lot of questions about Clinton Kane on there and kind of like exposed him. So if you wanna ask him to not upload that, I recommend that you do so. And Brooke was like, I'm gonna go reach out to Zach. Her thinking that her and Zach are good friends, that he would not upload the video. At this point, Brooke had talked about how she really wanted to protect Clinton Kane's image, how she did not feel like his mental health was strong enough. She did not know what kind of position he was in if he was already lying about such severe things and wanted to protect him from getting this information out there. This was prior to her talking about it on the podcast. This was prior to it all. So she begged Zach to not upload this portion about talking about Clinton Kane with Tana on his YouTube channel, which he still did anyway, and just ghosted Brooke. Brooke said that she was absolutely devastated about this, really, really heartbroken, and how she even saw him at a club like two weeks later, and he was like, was it really that bad? Like, it was it really that bad what I did? And she was very, very upset with him and was like sobbing. So Brooke said that after she made her 14 part series on TikTok, Zach still decided to clip the conversation about Clinton Kane from April 2023 and re-upload it, like a whole 12 minute clip onto his YouTube channel. He posts clips onto his TikTok, like basically taking advantage of the entire Brooke and Clinton situation, even though Brooke has expressed to Zach before like why she did not want him to be involved with this and to be exposing all of this. But once again, he's taking advantage of this all, even though she made it very clear to him, like, I don't want you to be breaking any of this news. Like, this is my story to tell. And Brooke said that Zach has not been a very good friend at all, and he had showed that. And she said that Zach saying is horrible. She said that when this entire situation was happening with Clinton and she was finding out that he was a pathological liar, she confided a lot in Zach. She was feeling very 
scared for her life because she did not feel the most mentally stable if you catch my drift and she decided to share all this information with him in confidence and the only thing that he had said to her in response was we are gonna sell this as a show we're gonna make a netflix documentary about this brooke had literal thoughts of taking her own life and zach saw money signs about around it all and the profit that he could make from it and then he decided to use that conversation even though she told him in confidence in his conversation with tana and then still upload it to youtube even though brooke asked him not to. Now, like I said, a little while later, Brooke and Zach did run into each other at a club. She was sobbing. He was like, was it that bad? He invited her on the Zach Sang show. She was like, sure, I'll go on one condition that we do not talk about Clinton. She gets there and that is the only thing that he wants to talk about. So she did not allow for this episode to come out, only small little short clips of that interview. Now, Brooke says that Zach Sang is an opportunistic, clout chasing piece of shit and how when she was blowing up his phone about how she was so upset with him and how she couldn't believe how dirty he did her he was ghosting her meanwhile on instagram she saw that he had sent phineas billy eilish's brother a bouquet of flowers just because just to kind of give you an idea of how clout chasing he really was couldn't give the time of day to his like actual friend but could give phineas o'connell flowers Brooke said recently that she heard that zach saying is actively shopping around to make a show out of the entire clinton kane thing and especially since brooke has put her story out on TikTok, her 14 part story, people have really benefited off of it. I mean, Zach Sang is now re-uploading videos with him and Tana talking about it. Like it's going on YouTube, it's going on TikTok. Tucker Pillsbury, the ex-boyfriend of Emma Chamberlain, he even made a funny TikTok about the situation where he was like, I have a collab with Clinton Kane with this song. Just kidding. It's not funny to lie about who you are. Like you should be honest. Guys, look at that woman remix with Clinton Kane is out now. Uh, just kidding. Guys, community is all about not lying and being honest with each other. Which then Brooke Schofield responded, this is hot, honestly. Kind of like them together. I like the idea of it, all right. Then Chris Olsen, the TikToker, also opened up about his own situation about having an abusive relationship from the past and how he was inspired by Brooke Schofield being so open and honest about this and how he felt like he could share his story. That's honestly a beautiful thing because it is women like Brooke that make me feel more comfortable talking about my story. I mean, I once shared a story about myself and I got in a lot of shit because of it, okay? And now I'm in a place where I am not comfortable sharing much about my situation. So Brooke being able to help others being open about their history with abusive relationships, amazing. That's wonderful. Like that's what it's all about, you know? And this is where some Chris Olsen, Haley Bailey drama comes in. Haley Bailey is once again in controversy because she was essentially making a mockery out of these stories where she had posted this like satirical video about how she broke up with her billionaire boyfriend, William, who is this just like ongoing running joke on her TikTok page. It's since deleted, but she talks about how like she had to have an NDA and how the NDA is over and people were like doing the math and like the timeline of things. And you know, they're like, a lot of these details don't make sense. She's clearly making a mockery out of like stories like Chris's and, and Brooke's. Since then, Chris Olsen called out Haley because of this, although he does say that he this is not directed at one specific person, so this is alleged, but he says that trauma is not trendy. This is not the place for satire. Basically, don't be on here while people are like talking about their horrific stories and being like, okay, this is a good like cash grab for me. Listen, I'm not above satire. I'm not above making up a little story on the internet for fun. Where satire and making up stories is not appropriate, it's stories about abuse. This isn't a trend to jump on because you see it's getting other people views. This is like my first video where Trisha Paytas like very naturally is, is involved with this. Trisha Paytas is obviously involved in every single video that I do. She's like very effortlessly involved in this story because she is friends with Brooke. And she's had her on the podcast multiple times. On the newest episode of Just Trish that literally just happened like yesterday, she talked with Brooke about her experience with Zach Sang. Trisha even mentions that like, even though she's friends with Zach Sang, she's very receptive to this new information about him. Trisha and her co-host even mentioned why is Clinton able to talk about this situation so openly and freely in his music because he's an artist and everything. But when Brooke talks about her traumatic relationship and how that has affected her, she is seen as yapping and that she's not allowed to talk about it. And perhaps that is because he doesn't see her job as high as his, as an artist. 
Just a reminder, I'm a musician. And Trisha even asked Brooke how Brooke would react if Clinton had made a response video. And Brooke actually encourages it because she says it's not too late for her redemption. It's not too late to ask for forgiveness. She said that she's a very forgiving person. It's not too late to just come to terms with what you did was wrong and how she's understanding of mental health as someone who herself struggles with mental health. And it's not too late to be honest and truthful and apologize for what you've done. Which brings me to my next point. I woke up this morning and sighed so hard. I sighed because I was like, ah! the video was gonna be done there. All right, the video was gonna be done there. And then I see like a 30 part fucking series from Clinton Kane. I was like, all right, let me pull out the Google doc. Oh, who the fuck did I date not marry? So let me sum up this like 30 part thing for you. Actually, it was 24 parts because you know, you know how he is about semantics. So like, I need to be extremely honest with my, with my numbers. Every single video was like titled exposing lie number one. And all it was was just clearing up semantics literal semantics a lot of this was also brought up by him pulling up screenshots in text and uber receipts a google calendar so when they started dating how long they were together like that is like literal things that he was like brooke lied about how long we were together four months versus three months when it actually like the timeline of everything that he ended up showing it did look like it was six months anyway it doesn't matter how they were not together every day they were only together out of 64 out of 125 days he made a fucking google calendar calendar and like color coded it all and then conveniently placed in the days that he was in therapy on purpose how brooke didn't say kid rock was hot she said she wanted to fuck kid rock how they didn't go to the diner for four hours it was actually only one hour that they were at the diner together they were not in a committed relationship before joshua tree they were in a committed relationship after joshua tree they were not pulled over on the way to joshua tree they were pulled over coming back from joshua tree how she found out that he lied about his age how he had friends when she said that he didn't when he said i love you who said I love you first podcast numbers versus music numbers comparing who gets more views Brooke said at best it's like you accuse a guy and you're like you were cheating on her you literally like took her in your car and you had sex with her and you bought her a sprite and the guy is like I never bought her a fucking sprite he is the type of guy who if you are texting a whole paragraph to him he will only respond to like the last sentence of that paragraph I was like losing my mind listening to this all because I was like Oh God, oh God. He also brings up how Brooke in an interview had said he must speak another language he never told me about. How scary is that? And he kept repeating the how scary is that? How scary is that? And he's like, what's so scary about being bilingual? He must also speak another language that he never told me about. So how scary is that? <laughs> so how scary is that? <laughs> so how scary is that? <laughs> how scary is it for someone to be bilingual? I don't understand why this would be scary. And also how we were only dating for three months. How do you know? You don't know everything about someone in three months. First of all, I'm bilingual. That's like one of the first things that when I am dating someone that I tell people I'm bilingual. Why? Because it's fucking cool. It's cool to be bilingual. Of course, I'm going to let someone know I'm bilingual. For your girlfriend to not know that you're bilingual three months into a relationship. Yeah, that's weird. Additionally, she was not saying bilingual is scary. It's scary that someone can cover up that they know a whole other language if you're in a whole ass committed relationship with one another. How one moment Brooke said that one of his biggest songs was Chicken Tendies, then I guess I'm in love. And he's like, so which one is it? Huh? He had one like really huge song about his dead mom, whatever. That's my biggest song is called I Guess I'm in Love. First, she says, my biggest song is about a girl I was in love with. And then second, she says, my biggest song is about my mom. You can't even keep up your lies. Shut the fuck up. How she recorded fights and that's illegal, but he was showing full on texts. Now, Brooke said, referring to his mom, his mom doesn't even speak English. In fact, I'm pretty sure she works in retail. Like his mom, I don't even think speaks English. So I'm like, his mom doesn't even speak English. I don't know what she speaks. His mom doesn't even speak English. I don't know what she speaks. She doesn't even speak English doesn't even first of all she does speak english she doesn't even speak english she doesn't even speak english that is a very triggering and offensive way to say that and also yes she does she does speak english present tense his mom's alive his mom's alive he literally just admitted right there his mom's alive case closed your mom's alive after 24 parts he finally then decides to take accountability. He did in fact admit to cheating, okay? He did in fact admit to love bombing, lie about the age thing because of embarrassment, and also admits that he was a baby man child. I don't understand. I feel like sitting here and trying to negate these 
semantics and trying to argue with someone about that, your accountability doesn't mean shit. You're not actually taking accountability for those things. He then goes on to make a video explaining his accent, how he was born in the Philippines. Before one, he moved to Australia. According to Google, he learned an average of 1,500 words with the regional dialect of Perth. I don't know why you need Google for that. He then moved to the UK with a regional dialect of Manchester, then went to Brunei, then Singapore, then Cyprus. And then when he was 18, went to Greece and then the US and then Amsterdam and then Sri Lanka and then Indonesia and then back to the USA. Yet, I did find a TikTok in which he told a girl that he was DMing that he was born in Perth, Australia. Yes, I'm from Australia. I was born in Perth. Um, I lived there for a total of eight years. And then I lived like half of my life in the UK. He's like, I, I never lied about where I was from. Like, yes, you did. You lied a lot about where you were from. I don't actually give a fuck if his accent is real or not. I genuinely don't care. That is the least craziest thing about this all. I find that like lying about dead people in your life is far bigger and like cheating on people is far bigger. It's, it's scary. It's definitely scary to lie about your accent, but that seems like the most minuscule thing to lie about in the grand scheme of things. It's almost expected. Like if you're gonna lie about like cheating and your family members being dead, you're probably gonna lie about your accent. You know what I mean? He said that his record label needed a place to say that he was from when he got signed to them. And he said Australia because it was a beautiful memory and he didn't want to explain his story every time he made small talk with a stranger. Small talk with a stranger, you mean like your fucking interviews that you do with Zach saying, like your big time interviews, that's not small talk. People are interested. If you were like, yeah, I had this really, really diverse upbringing where I grew up in a lot of different countries. People like to hear about things like that. That's not small talk. And then he went on to make a 10 minute video explaining how Brooke has been ruining his life and ruining it by still talking about it actively. How he made friends with an older woman that he knew for a year that he considered his mom because he did not consider his biological mom his mom because, you know, they had a strained relationship. He said that saying that his mother, who he had that strained relationship with, who was the pastor, died just fit. And he refers to himself as a punk kid who gave a dumb answer on a podcast. That's very bold to say. To say you're a punk kid at the age of like 22 is like wild. I was not pathologically lying. I don't know, consistently lying about things over and over again. It kind of seems pathological. And he refers to that interview as management fucking up that day, but I guess I'll take accountability for it. Why are you still blaming other people? That's not taking accountability. That's quite literally not what taking about accountability. Ah! And then he says that this drama with his ex-girlfriend forced him to see that if he didn't make a change, that he would end up just like his family and just like her if he didn't make a change. And then he goes on, I never said a bad thing about my ex-girlfriend, but ending up like her is terrible. Anyway, never brings up the lying about a dead brother, even though people are speculating that that is not true either. But apparently his father really did pass away. He said he will be dedicating his time and money towards his mental health, which I really genuinely, honestly, not ironically hope so. I had a really hard time listening to everything that he had to say because I'm not gonna lie to you, he really reminded me of a relationship that I was in at one point. This is something oftentimes that abusers will do is they will find a way to make themselves a victim out of an entire narrative and story that they have basically been guilty of. Like, okay, how can I pin the blame on the actual victim. A lot of people on TikTok are saying that it's sketchy how Brooke was exaggerating and a lot of things on her timeline may have not been 100% accurate or correct. I actually do not give a rat's ass about semantics. I do not give a fuck if they said I love you three days in or four days in. I don't give a fuck if they got pulled over on the way to Joshua Tree or on the way back from Joshua Tree. I don't care about those things. I don't care how many days you spent with her. I don't care about the little semantics like that because it's the little semantics like this that abusers will often use to try and negate what you are actually saying. Like, look, she's not trustable. She's not believable. Like, you cannot trust a word that this woman says because she can't keep her story straight. She said that we were together 68 days out of 124, but when in reality, we were only together 65 days. Quite literally, she was talking about how he made a reservation with friends for Nobu for seven people. And he was like, no, it was for four people. I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. And I actually do not feel sorry for any of the people that are commenting in the comments being like, I don't know. I suddenly believe Clinton. I don't know. Brooke's got some explaining to do. While this is so parasocial and we do not know these people and we are not in their lives, I have a lot of empathy for Brooke because I know exactly what it is like to be in her shoes. Except this time, it's like out for the public and now people are like putting their two cents into things when i got out of this said relationship i was painted as a liar how things were not true all because of these stupid little semantics like i would be like 
yeah, my ex was abusive because he would scream at me and he wouldn't let me see my friends and he would control me and he was really terrible to me and wouldn't allow me to spend time with my family and he made me cry multiple times every single day. And then he would turn around and be like, well, you picked up a shift at work instead of hanging out with me. It's these little ass stupid semantics to find a way to place blame on you. Does it actually matter if they sat in a diner for one hour or four hours? I don't care. I don't care. And you shouldn't care either. Not to mention, when you are going through something so tumultuous, like an abusive relationship, where it is filled with so much anguish and so much trauma and anxiety, you do not remember these little tiny stupid fucking details. I'm telling you right now, when I used to be in these huge blow up arguments with my ex, where he was literally screaming at me and throwing tantrums and throwing things physically across the room, I wouldn't even know where the argument had started. You could hold a gun to my head and be like, how did this fight start? I could not tell you for the life of me. Couldn't tell you because everything becomes like a blur. When you're fighting with someone who is so incredibly, I, I, I want to be careful about the use of the word narcissistic because I know that it is a diagnosis that people actually do have. But I guess I should say narcissistic tendencies or when they have these very, very toxic and abusive tendencies and actions, you quite literally cannot even recall sometimes what you were talking about or what that relationship even looked like. Like you, you can't remember. The highs are so high and the lows are so low. That's like all you can remember. I think it's also crazy to say that you are taking accountability for your actions, yet blaming your ex for talking about the exact situation and the things that you literally put her through. Yeah, that's not taking accountability if you are still being like, I don't know why she's talking about it. She's yapping. Literally, the only thing he could have ever done to her was cheat. Forget about all the lies. Forget about, you know, like lying about dead parents and, and accents and whatever. He could literally just cheat on Brooke and Brooke still has every single right to still be yapping about it two years later. You put someone through something so traumatic and gaslit them and broke up with them because they questioned you. If they were cheating on you or not. They have every right to talk about it for as long as they want because you put them through that. That is just reality. <laughs> I see a lot of people quite literally being like, I'm on Clinton's side. You are being gaslit by him. And unfortunately, that is exactly why Brooke kept going back to him. Because if you are so easily gaslit by 24 videos on his TikTok and we don't even know him, imagine what it would be like to be in a relationship with him and love him. Way easier to be gaslit and way easier to keep going back to him. Anyway, as of two hours ago, Brooke has responded. It's been pretty fun to watch, to be honest, because she's been saying everything that I've been saying, essentially, like the fucking semantics, the fucking Google calendar. Brooke confirmed that they were together for longer than three months. She said that he cheated on her with dozens of women. He didn't admit to that. He just said he cheated. He told Brooke that his mom fell down the stairs with Birkenstocks, that she was in a coma, that he was hit by a car. How ridiculous that all is now in the grand scheme of things that he is trying to sit here and be like, I never said my biological mother died. Because she's like, you, you did though. You quite literally did. And you gave very specific stories, like getting hit by a car, being in a coma falling down the stairs. Brooke said that one time she had like made a joke about like, what if I fell down the stairs right now? And how he got really upset. Cause he's like, you know, my mom died by falling down the stairs. There's also this like notes app list of things that she could have done to him and expose him for that are not as half as bad as what he did to her. Like for example, tell the world that his family's alive. Tell people that he made me cry every single time I didn't want to have sex with him. How he told Brooke, you won't, when she said that she wanted to kill herself. How he had a sex tape on his phone from the night before when she flew out to him. He coincidentally chose to not address any of those, but chose to still be like, I am a victim because people are telling me that I didn't experience these things, that my life is a lie when it's not, and because Brooke keeps talking about it and doesn't let me live my life. Anyone who is saying Brooke has lost all credibility, I hope it never happens to you. I hope to God that this situation never happens to you in your life. I hope that you never experience somebody who is so abusive to you and so manipulative and that you feel safe and secure in all of your future relationships. I genuinely, genuinely really hope that. I don't wish anybody to go through a situation that like Brooke did, that like I did, like my mom did, like a million other women do all the time. I don't wish it upon anybody. Abusive relationships can happen to anybody and you are not immune. You are not above an abusive relationship. You cannot outsmart an abusive relationship. You are not suddenly like better than all of us because you have not been in one. And I genuinely hope it does not happen to you because it should not fucking happen to anyone. So anyway, case closed. I'm sure that there's gonna be more about this. Brooke's gonna respond. I wouldn't be surprised if Clinton ends up saying something else. But as of right now, I can't keep looking at this man. I can't, I can't. Sorry, but if you're annoying and manipulative, you don't get to have nice photos of yourself on my wall. If you like this video, make sure that you leave it a like. It's all not so much. I'll leave a comment if you want, whatever you want. 
make sure you subscribe if you want to be nice. If not, you're disgusting. Also, make sure you have your bell notifications on so you know every single time I post, or you're gross. If you want to follow me on my other social media, Instagram, Twitter, Deepop, Spotify, just Anna Nicole Raffi. If you want to follow me on my TikToks at Nikki Nasty, I have a podcast that comes out every other Monday, and I also have merch. If you're interested in trying Semper, make sure that you use code 55Nicole or the QR code that's on screen or the link that's down below for 55% off your order at Semper. Thank you, Semper, for sponsoring today's video. And I'm gonna go. And I'm literally gonna go on TikTok to see if Brooke has posted anything, because I know she has. Okay, bye. <laughs>